the Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, O Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters. Mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Welcome to Majesty. My name is Ron McKinney and I'm pastor of Kinsey Drive Baptist Church in Dalton, Georgia. And I'm pleased that you're watching the program today. I would like to say something before we begin uh, the message. And we do have a guest speaker and I'll introduce you to him in just a moment. But I'd like to mention that we're having a special Bible conference at Kinsey Drive Baptist Church. And that's October the 8th, 9th and 10th. And it's entitled Christ from Beginning to End. Uh, it's a title that I love because it talks about the fact that everything has to do with Christ. And our speakers are very special to me. Uh, Shane Kassler comes from Lake Charles, Louisiana, Heritage Baptist Church. He's been there for about seven or eight years and he's an excellent speaker. And I invite you to come and hear him. And also we have with us Ed Fleming, who is a missionary to India and actually goes to other parts of the, of the world. But he's a fine preacher of the gospel and we're pleased that he's gonna be with us as well. Now, remember those dates and I'll mention them at the end of the program again. That's March 8th, 9th and 10th <coughs> of 2019. And it's everyone is welcome to come. We'll give you more details if you'd like to call us. We have, at the end of the program, we'll have the address and phone number. And also we'll tell you about our website, kinseydrivebaptistchurch.com. Today I have with me a guest, uh, his name is Chris Pierce. And I'm pleased to have Chris with us today. Uh, Chris has been attending Kinsey Drive Baptist Church and he's been doing some preaching uh, for us. And I found him to be an excellent expositor of the Word of God. So much today is just a little bit of hype and not a whole lot of substance. But uh, what Chris has done is he's brought the Word of God. Uh, he comes to us with a lot of experience. And yet at the same time, he's been taught of the Lord. And I think of what it says of Paul, Chris. Uh, it says that I didn't learn this from men. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord is the one that taught me. Yeah. He spoke on First Peter uh, the other evening for us and it was excellent. And I'm so pleased to have him come and bring us a message today. Welcome, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take your time and give us a message here from First Peter. All right. Peter is writing to several different churches in several different areas. And it's a letter that's going to be read to the churches. So I would invite you to turn to First Peter chapter 1. He begins his introduction to the elect exiles. You could even say the scattered strangers, uh, if you would, in different areas of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And then he begins to address the Trinity itself when he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. Mm -hmm. And he says something that's an encouragement to all of us who would read this. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Not just extended, but multiplied over and over. And then he begins in verse 3 to share some things with us that are going to lead up to a statement that he makes when he says, things into which angels long to look. It's a staggering statement to realize that there are things that angels themselves are curious about and long to look into. And so when we read that phrase, which is down in verse 12, it's referring to all the things that are preceding it in verses 3 up into verse 12. So let's see what these things are that Peter's referring to when he says these are things into which angels long to look. Beginning in verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And even in that phrase that we might be uh, tempted to just keep on reading past and not take the time to understand the impact of what he has said there, when he says blessed, that word in the Greek itself is where we get our word eulogy, which we all know at funerals is when somebody stands up and says good things and nice things and even great things about the person who has passed. But here Peter is referring to God himself and he is ascribing praise to him. When he's saying he is blessed, he is saying that he is worthy to be honored, to be praised, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's an exclamation point at the end of that that Peter's excited about what he's saying concerning God. And then he goes on, he says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. And I'm going to stop right there just for a moment because he gives the context that it is according to God's mercy, not just any mercy, but great mercy, which is overwhelming because you and I are born in trespasses, in sin, dead in our sins, not deserving anything except the punishment that we are due for the sin of our nature, the sins that we commit. And yet God extends, Peter reminds us here, his great mercy. It's according to that that he has caused us to be born again. The language is very clear that God does something that we and of ourselves can't do. He causes us to be born again. There's an old hymn that so many of us have sung. It's been sung all over the world, very well known across many denominations, and that's the hymn Rock of Ages. It was written by Augustus Toplady, who not only wrote that song, but wrote several things concerning God. One statement he made was this, a man's free will cannot cure him even of the toothache or of a sore finger, and yet he madly thinks it is in his power to cure his soul. Yeah. He's reminding us of the very thing that Peter's saying here. God has caused us to be born again. And then he goes on to say, to a living hope. If you and I were honest this morning, we would say that a lot of what we see and experience, whether we watch the news or whether it's in our day-to-day -day life or the things that we face, sometimes seem hopeless. And yet here, Peter is saying that God has caused us to be born again to a living hope. It's not only hope itself beyond anything we can imagine. It's living. It's alive. It's real. And he tells us that it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is not in ourselves. It's not in our circumstances. It's not in our government. It's not in all the things that we tend to devote much of our time to. Our hope, our living hope is in the reality that Jesus Christ himself rose from the dead. Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 12, that if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people to be most pitied. It's an alarming thing to think that if Christ were not risen from the dead, all of this, all of our faith, everything that, that we are hoping for, that we are holding on to is pointless, is futile. And it brings up the reality that there are many today, uh, many beyond that we can count, live without believing in the existence of God himself, without believing uh, in the message of God through his word to us concerning 
His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on our behalf for our sins and then rose again and day to day live without hope. It's a horrifying and staggering thing to imagine, but it explains why such misery is so prevalent because I can't imagine what it would be like to live without the hope that we have in Christ, who is our substitute and our Savior for our sin and who also conquered the grave, death, hell itself, rose from the dead so that we could have this living hope through His resurrection. Our life without this is futile and it's empty. And I would contend for those who are struggling to look to the reality of Christ who died for you and who rose again so that you could have this living hope through Him. He said, if it's in this life only, we are of all, most, of all people most to be pitied. And then He says something that gives great joy. He says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Not only do we have this living hope through the res resurrection of Christ from the dead, but then he goes on in verse 4 to begin to tell us about our inheritance. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There's much to be said about inheritance. There is much that goes on concerning uh, inheriting things from those from family who have gone before. And the reality is even that is temporal. Even that only lasts for a moment. But here, Peter begins to expound on all that we have, this living hope that we have, this being born again that we have, and now an inheritance that he describes as imperishable. There is no expiration date on our inheritance. It's undefiled. It is completely pure. And it's unfading. It will ne never wither away. All of these things describe something that can take us beyond the temporary of what we live to realize that there is so much that we not only have now through our salvation in Christ, but through the salvation that is yet to be revealed in all of eternity and an inheritance that is being kept in heaven. Specifically, he says, for you, it becomes personal. It's for the people he's writing this letter to and it extends through time to us. It's being kept for us. It will never perish. It will, it's completely pure and it will not wither. It will not fade. It's being kept in heaven. So part of our living hope extends beyond the circumstances of our life, whatever we're struggling with, into this reality of heaven. I believe it was D.L. Moody that said, some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I would contend the opposite sometimes can be true. We can be so earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. We lose sight of the things that are yet to come, to the hope that we're holding on to, that all of this is just temporary passing and fading of that inheritance it's being kept for us in heaven he then goes on to say in verse 5 who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time it's it's already overwhelming to see the things that we have according to God's mercy in Christ this inheritance that we hold on to and then he says that we are being guarded by God's power. Not hanging on by a thread, not hoping somehow, some way everything's going to work out. We are literally guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We talk about our salvation and being saved from the wrath of God, being saved from sin, being saved from ourselves. And that is our present reality of salvation. But then here Peter is talking about the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time, the ultimate 
unveiling of the salvation of Christ. And he says it's in verse 6, it's in this that you rejoice. We rejoice with anticipation of our future glorification. That's an incredible, incredible promise to hang on to. There's the great reveal of our future salvation, but there is also the great reality of our present salvation. He said, it's in this that you rejoice. And he's about to segue into something that's challenging often for us to take hold of when he says, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We don't like to deal with trouble. We don't like to deal with trial. We don't like to deal with testing, with persecution, all of these things. But when we see it in the context of what Peter's saying here, in this, all of the things that he's mentioned regarding our living hope, regard, regarding being born again through Christ, in this you rejoice, though now things are not always going to be easy. But it's for a little while. If necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. We try to avoid, avoid trouble, but the reality is, as Christians, we've been guaranteed that things are not going to be easy. 2 Timothy 3.12, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, will suffer persecution. It's unavoidable. James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. What we have to remember in order to rejoice in the midst of trial is that it's not about us, because He gives us the reason for it. It's to test the genuine of our faith, and so that it may be found and result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not for us. It's for His praise, for His honor, for His glory. Our focus has to be beyond the circumstances and the struggles that we deal with and by faith onto the Savior who is worthy and deserves our praise, honor, and glory. It's a process that we must endure for the one who endured everything in order to fulfill the will of God and in order that we might know the salvation of God through Him. He says in verse 8, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So many times we put God to the test, so to speak, or conversations that I've had with people concerning the things of God and the things of Christ, often the response is that they want it to be proven to them, that they want to see the evidence. And yet here, Peter reminds us, though you have not seen him, you love him. When Thomas was doubting at the reappearance of Christ after the resurrection, and Jesus began to show him the, the nail prints in his hand, began to show him his side. And at that point, Thomas was convinced and believed. And Jesus' response to him was, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. It's required by faith that we focus on the truth of God's Word to us by faith and not demanding evidence because we have no right to demand anything from the Creator who spoke everything into existence and then by grace speaks our name and calls us to Himself. He says, out of all of these things, 
it results in, you see the word rejoice yet again. You see rejoice before he talks about the trials and all of these struggles for the genuineness of our faith. And then the word rejoice shows up again. And he, and he even expands on it when he says, with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. So full of joy that we don't even know how to articulate it. Having, having such a consuming, uh, overwhelming happiness with gratitude, with joy for what God has done for us in Christ, the very gospel itself, that we are not worthy, but the one who is stood in our place. Uh, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then in verse 10, he says, concerning this salvation, everything that he's just talked about is regarding our salvation. He says, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. A reminder yet again that this is personal. God is not some arbitrary enigma in the sky, so to speak, but personally, the salvation that's been extended, the gospel that has been proclaimed to us, all of these things are for you. Even the prophets themselves who were prophesying of the future suffering of Christ and it says subsequent glories, always remember that there's the sufferings of Christ and there's the yet to come subsequent glories as a result. It reminds us of what Paul said in Philippians, to know the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. All of that ties together. The prophets were proclaiming these things concerning what was to come and they were doing it for you, for us. He says, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news, the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and here it is, things into which angels long to look. Our living hope through the resurrection of Christ, our inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and unfading, all of these things, the sufferings that we have to endure for the, the genuineness of our faith to be tested and proven, not so that we can get recognition for anything else, but so that Christ can be glorified, honored, and praised. It's about Him. It's not about us. All of this, even the things that the, the prophets had talked about, and concerning Christ and his suffering and the subsequent glories, all of these things concerning the salvation, the gospel, the good news that's been preached to us by the Holy Spirit, these are the things which angels long to look into. May we never become comfortable or complacent or used to the overwhelming reality of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who extended his grace to us who were dead in our trespasses and sin, so that we might become alive eternally through the salvation of God himself. It's amazing. Charles Spurgeon said this, does anyone suppose that he knows all about the gospel and does not need further hours of study, thought, and prayer? Poor, miserable fool. Angels who are vastly superior to us in intelligence desire to learn and know more. It can never be that we are so familiar and used to these things that we lose the overwhelming, inexpressible joy that comes from realizing that God himself gave Christ to die on our behalf as our substitute for our sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It's a matter of looking to him 
calling upon Him and being saved. It's the things that angels long to look into. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today with an overwhelming sense of gratitude. We in and of ourselves are hopeless and helpless, mm -hmm. dead in our trespasses and sins, separated from you. But you in your goodness and your grace and according to your mercy have provided us hope that is alive and is living through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that today we can call upon you, we can turn, we can look to you and be saved, everyone to the ends of the earth. God, today, would you please grant us to be as amazed as the angels hmm. and may we long to look into the greatness of your gospel, of our salvation. And may all of the testing and trial that we go through be at the ultimate end for your praise, your glory, and your honor. It's in your name that we pray, amen. Amen, thank you, Chris. Excellent message on the hope, our living hope, and uh, things that, uh, the prophets look forward to. They didn't, they were not able to see that, but we see it. And uh, the angels are amazed, are they not? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. I just want to mention again, we're going to have this special conference that's coming up on March the 8th, 9th, and 10th with uh, Shane Kassler from Lake Charles, Louisiana, and Ed Fleming from Pennsylvania. These two men are excellent preachers. And if you want more information, you can go to our website, and that's kinseydrivebaptistchurch.com, and you can get all the information that you need. We also have our address on the screen now, 2626 Kinsey Drive. You can write us a note, or you can go to the website, either one. We just love to hear from you. And we invite you to come and be with us and worship with us. We meet on Sunday mornings. We have Sunday school at 10 and a worship service at 11. And then on Sunday night, we have a Bible study and Chris will be speaking this evening. And I invite you to come and hear more on 1 Peter. And uh, we invite you to come then on Wednesday nights. We're still studying through the book, Transforming Grace. It's still something we're studying. Now, I love this book because it teaches us how God takes us through, the, through life in terms of giving us grace in everything that we do. And I invite you to come and be with us. Uh, anytime you want to have any information, you can go to the website or you can call and ask at the church and uh, we'd love to have you. Until next week at the same time and on the same station, may God richly bless you. The Lord reigns, he is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and is armed with strength. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity.